Cal State Dominguez Hills. That was our own Dr. T.O. Avery, jazz faculty in the music. And that's just a prelude of the great music we're going to hear this afternoon uh, as our, at our presidential lecture event. Today, this afternoon, you're going to hear three, three of the best saxophonists in Southern California. You just heard Dr. Uh, T.O. Avery, the man who can channel Monk and Train. Later in the program, you'll hear from Chica Inua, and uh, she'll be playing with Scott Morris, and Chica is easily one of the best classical saxophonists in the region. And of course, we are here this afternoon. Uh, last but not least, it's that time of year when we all get out our Miracles holiday albums and uh, listen to Kenny G. And that's why we're here, to listen to the incomparable music and performance of Kenny G, the master of smooth jazz. So welcome, Torals, to the Dominguez Hills Presidential Lecture Series. My name is Mitch Avila, and I'm the Dean of the College of Arts and Humanities. I have the best job on campus, and that's why it's my pleasure to serve as your MC for our today's event. President Parham established the Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series to engage the campus and the surrounding community in thought-provoking discussions on some of the society's most pressing issues. And each year, the campus brings leading scholars, artists, and leaders to share their thoughts and experiences with our Toro community. Previous programs have included Olympic gold medalist Tommy Smith, and uh, NFL uh, athlete Reggie Bush, and California Attorney General, off to join the uh, Biden administration, Xavier Becerra. Today, and I think we're all excited about this, we have the unique privilege of having a discussion between President Parham and the Grammy Award winner, Kenny G. His career has spanned over four decades, and he is the biggest selling musician of smooth jazz ever, right? With worldwide share sales of over 75 million records. And as you all know, because you own a copy of this, one of the best selling holiday albums ever recorded. So I'm super excited. And so it's my point and my privilege at this time to turn over the stage to uh, President Parham, a president of our university. Dr. Parham, the stage is yours. Thank you, Dean Avila. And let me say good afternoon and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the faculty, staff, senior executives, and the 17,727 students at this magnificent institution, and on behalf of our First Lady, my wife, Davida Hopkins Parham, I want to welcome you and add my voice to the chorus of those that have welcomed guests from across the nation for our fall 2020 Presidential Distinguished Lecture Series. I'm delighted and honored that you have joined us. Now, even though Dean Avila has left the stage, I want to take a point of privilege and recognize him because the best thing I can do as a leader is surround myself with good people, but also understand that good people have a need to grow. Dean Avila has recently been appointed as provost of California State University's Channel Island. And so I'd like you all to join me in a virtual round of applause for Dean Avila there, one of our best, who is now going on to do great things at California State University Channel Island. Dean Avila, we salute you. Now, before we go on, I also want to provide a level of thanks rather than waiting until the end. Because programs like this, even with the president's vision for a distinguished lecture series, do not happen without the hard work, persistence, and perseverance of lots of people. And so I want to thank a couple of offices in particular, our ceremonies and events team led by Marilyn McPoden uh, and Kim Larsons. I want to thank uh, our technology team, uh, Bernie uh, and Fidel. Uh, I want to thank Arancha. I want to thank the whole team who have really put this together to make this evening very enjoyable for you. So please join me in thanking them with a virtual round of applause as well as we get started on the day. Please join me. Now, academic institutions like California State University, Dominguez Hills, should be the places where people are challenged to think critically, challenged to discover new ideas, to think about theoretical and conceptual possibilities, to study natural, physical, and social science, business and education, 
and use that learning to incorporate facts and data to help students and academicians alike form more cogent and persuasive arguments and reveal really to all how the arts allow us to experience joy, to interpret deeper meanings and symbols, to foster creativity, and how the arts provide a more authentic access to an individual humanity and a group's culture. You know, my friends, it was Maurice White, the late founder of one of my favorite groups and leader of Earth, Wind and Fire, who asserted that music is the language of the soul. And it has a spiritual energy that speaks to all who are in tune with its rhythms and vibrations. So I invite all of you to be in tune with the rhythms and the vibrations of this evening's program. Now I was first introduced to Kenny G's instrumental stylings in the mid eighties. And as I listened to albums like Dual Tones featuring songs like Songbird and Midnight Motion. But by the time the early nineties rolled around I was even more inspired and enamored with his Breathless album, with songs which happened to be my favorites, like End of the Night and Morning. His melodic rhythms tickle our ears, they ignite our emotions, they help us all create mental representations of those happy thoughts that align with his instrumental stylings. Now, we arrive at this particular place through some work of some very important people. Our California State University Dominguez Hills Philanthropic Board Chair Maria Villa and her husband Steve Lathrop have been instrumental in facilitating Kenny getting to our campus this evening. And they initiated our contact by winning a charity auction event at a Honda Under the Stars that Kenny was featured at. That auction item with a round of golf was supplemented with the gift of this saxophone that you see here. And as they then won the auction that allowed me to both play with Kenny and the foursome with Steve, Kenny also autographed this photograph or uh, saxophone and gave this instrument to Steve and Maria. They in turn then donated this particular instrument to California State University Dominguez Hills, where it sits in a prominent place, both in our department of music and with our library in a case, but they wanted to donate it to make sure that people could use it, not simply put it in a case, so know that it gets used. So we are delighted from that round of golf, and I simply asked Kenny, would you be willing to do a distinguished lecture? And in the most gracious and human way that he could, he simply said yes. Kenny Gorlick was born and raised, my friends, in Seattle, Washington, and he started playing saxophone at the age of 10. And after seeing a performance on, you remember this, the Ed Sullivan Show. And during his teenage years, Kenny fell in love with R&B music, and he's incorporated that love into his music ever since. His first professional gig occurred in 1973, while Kenny was still in high school. And the 17-year-old got his feet wet in the industry when he was hired to play saxophone for a Seattle performance by Barry White's Love Unlimited Orchestra. How fabulous is that? So after graduating high school, Kenny continued his musical explorations, even as he worked toward a degree in accounting at the University of Washington. In 1982, Kenny was signed to a recording contract by Arista Records and released his self-titled first album. He honed his sound over the course of two more years and other albums and then really hit the creative and commercial stride with the 1986 release of the album Dual Tone. So over the course of his amazing career, and it's been amazing, he's been nominated for 16 Grammy Awards, winning the 1994 Best Intermental Composition Grammy for his song Forever in Love. Now also, Kenny's outstanding success stems largely from the connections he makes with his audiences. And he's known oftentimes for stepping off of the stage during concerts and playing among his fans. He certainly did that the night I met him, showcasing his physical way and close attachment that he feels with those who love his music. I'm sure that's lots of you on this program tonight. So during his decade spanning career, he's played with such legendary performers as Aretha Franklin, Shaka Khan, Whitney Houston, Barbara Streisand, Burke Bacharach, 
George Benson, Peebo Bryson on that wonderful hit by the time this night is over. And one of my favorites, we saved the best for last with Smokey Robinson. He also lent his silky smooth sounds to projects from artists as diverse as Weezer, Katy Perry, Kanye West, Earth, Wind & Fire, and even played with that rising star, his son, Max G. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our fall 2020 Presidential Distinguished Lecture guest artist, the one and only Kenny G. Hey, I love that thing that uh, Dr. Tio Avery played. I had to do it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. How you doing? Nice to see you. I have something special for you. Uh oh. I know you love that song. End of the night. You know I love it. Great to see you, my Good friend. To see you. Okay. There we. So let's start out because I know our, our audience wants to know, from where do you draw most of the inspiration for your music? Where does that come from? Uh, you know, I, w I really wish I could answer that because then I would just go there every time I want to write music. But it, it just kind of comes to me. I, I feel like I'm a lucky person that, that really recognizes when something special happens. It could be just... It could just be a feeling inside. Then all of a sudden it comes out as a melody. It could be me listening to a record. Could be me listening to that great melody that Dr. Uh, T.O. Avery played. You know, that could inspire something. And somehow the notes just seem to make sense to me. I play it on my sax. It could be in a, in a practice session that I'm just practicing just arpeggios and, and exercises and, and all these kind of things that you do. And all of a sudden, something will stick out and just hits me in the right spot. And, I'm, and there you go. Wow. It's nice to be blessed with that kind of improvisation and creativity to be able to just do that. Yeah, I, I, I often uh, try not. You know how they say, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Like sometimes I don't really want to think about it too much because then I might have some thought process as, well, I can write a song <laughs> if this happens. And I just kind of just kind of let it just go. And I'm, I'm all, always surprised at the end of a project when I've completed an album. I, I listen to it and I think, how did those songs come to be? I can't even remember how it happened. And that's the magic. So speaking of that magic, I mean, I've got friends all over the place. Uh, uh, I want us to say hello to my wife, Davida Hopkins Parham, my first lady. And uh, I've got friends all the way from Philadelphia and Jeff Witt, Kent, and friends local, uh, Ken Bentley in LA. But as a psychologist, Kenny, I've come to believe that, that ideas are the substance of behavior. Ideas are the substance of behavior. So in that regard, the ideas we advance are often anchored in the values we hold near and dear. So what are the values that you communicate in your music? And what specific songs that you have performed reflect specific values that are important to you? Really good question. And with instrumentals, it's hard for me to specific, specify a song, but I'll tell you the values that I, I think I'm putting out there and I'm trying to, and that is I'm pretty meticulous about the things I do. You know, you and I play golf together. So, I mean, I'm sure that you, after nine holes, you were probably going, wishing that I would stop talking about all the minutiae and the mechanics of the golf swing because I'm so excited about every little detail, wanting to get everything just perfect. And I say that with music, but it doesn't make it sterile to me. There's something that um, I'm very meticulous. I'm here in my studio and when I'm recording, every note has to be exactly the way I want it to be. And if it isn't, I'll replay it and I'll replay it and I'll replay it. And if I'm not... Uh, if my, if my mechanics are stumbling a little bit, they don't anymore, but it's years and years of practice. Like every day, I still practice three hours a day, every day, every day wow. on a vacation, Sundays, Saturdays, every day for, you know, the last four or five decades, 
I practice my three hours. And so when I'm making my music, I'm hoping that what, what people are feeling or what they, maybe it's intangible, but I want them to know that this is a dedication to the, to the mastery of it, even though, as we all know, you can never master a musical instrument. You can always try, but I keep trying and I keep trying every song. Can I make that note a little bit sweeter? Can I make it a little bit better? Can I make the run a little faster? Um, and I do that with every song. So I think that's kind of the message that I put out in my music. Yeah, that's beautiful to hear. I mean, it, it reminds me in psychology as I've taught over the years, we talk about this alchemical process of human transformation toward perfectibility. It's like we, we be in the moment, but we are always in the state of becoming more better. It's always in search of that. And whether you get to perfect, there's no such thing other than the creator, but trying to just get more better every day helps you do that. And I hope our students are taking note about the kind of commitment it takes to be able to have a career like yours. So wonderful. Yeah. And also, I mean, I'm lucky that I love to do it. I mean, when I practice in the morning, it's not like, oh, here we go. I've got to put in my three hours. Honestly, I can't wait to even wake up in the morning. I can't wait. I can't wait to get that sax out of the case. I can't wait to start my practice session. I can't even wait. I love it. And yeah, in the middle of it, you know, I'm working on things and sometimes it gets a little frustrating when I'm trying to play something and I can't get it. But I also know that with my experience that if I can't get it today, maybe two months from now, I'll have it completely down, maybe six months from now, but I'll have it. And then it'll be part of my repertoire forever and ever. And I've been adding to that for the last 50 years and plus. So that's why, you know, when you, when you do something consistently for a long period of time, if you're lucky that you love it, then it's a pleasure. Yeah, yeah, no, and that's, that's clear to see the passion. Now, you know at Cal State University, Dominguez Hills, we have a very diverse campus, one of the most diverse campuses in the nation, uh, our students and faculty as well. And your music, Kenny, has entertained millions of people all over the world and is universally embraced by various cultural groups. And so if you're, you know, at the American Music Awards and winning those and Grammys and NAACP Image Awards and Latin Grammys, I mean, to what do you attribute your popularity that so excites people of diverse racial and ethnic and other demographic backgrounds? Wow. Well, I, when you say all those things, I, I'm thinking, are you really talking about me for <laughs> those awards? Oh, yeah. yeah um, you know, uh, honestly, I, I, and I use this word um, very, very respectfully, the word soul. I use it. I'm a white guy, but I'm going to use the word soul. And I think that there's a certain soul that somehow, you know, how, how I came to be able to put that in through a saxophone. It's there. And whether it's, you know, um, like when I first started making records, um, you know, I wanted to sound like Grover Washington Jr. And then I wanted to sound like John Coltrane. And then I wanted to sound like Stan Getz and then Sonny Rollins. And I, you know, I tried to emulate and then, but it all came out in a certain way. And the first radio stations that played my music were all R&B radio stations. And for some reason that they could feel the, the soul that I have in my, in my playing. And I think that that's, I say the word soul, but it doesn't necessarily apply to one demographic. It applies to like my, my music's really popular in China. Okay. Super popular. One of the songs that I wrote is actually a song that they play in China. It's almost like a national anthem. And I'm not saying this to brag. I'm just saying it. As a fact, they play it every day and they played it for like 34, 35 years or so. The song is played for 400, 500 million people every day. So why are they connecting with my music? Because there's a certain soul in there that they connect to. And I'm just really lucky that I, when I play that saxophone, there's something that in my heart and soul that comes out through it. And it's touching people in their heart and soul. And somehow we're connected and it's, it's a blessing and I'm, I'm very lucky and I, I don't take it for granted, but it's also something that I didn't like calculate. It's just, you know, it's, it's how the stars line up and that's why, you know, life is so wonderful. These wonderful, magical things can happen. Yeah, for me, I would call that, you know, going back to my psychology roots, really the ess essence of authenticity. Mm. I mean, the way you and I've connected even in, in meeting briefly and now getting connected there's just something to the authenticity in the same way that Maury's wife from Earthling and Fire talked about music is the language yeah. of the soul. And it connects to people in doing that. That's, that's fabulous. Yeah. So 
musicians and recording artists, much like athletes and entertainers, have often used their celebrity and their platforms for social justice causes. So what is the cost and the benefit, the cost and benefit to these musical artists whose voices speak authentically about circumstances in the nation and the world that trouble all of our hearts and our spirits, particularly about what's going on in the country yeah, now? That's a tricky platform. It really is because uh, celebrities, um, you know, they can be accused of not being in touch with how, you know, let's say, um, a, a more normal lifestyle person would live. It's like, well, what is, how can they relate to me? They're, they're talking about this and that. So it's a tricky platform. I like to do, I like to do stuff more than I like to say stuff. So in other words, I'd rather go play it at, at a fundraiser for a cause that I, that I believe in rather than going online and, and then talking about it because it's tough, you know, again, people can go, what do you know? It's easy for you to say, you don't have to worry about this. You've got all these things. And, but if you, if you, if you put your action there, the action is it's, you know what? It's really a lot of the, a lot of the causes. The main thing is fundraising. And as far as I'm, as, as I see it, because that can make that can make some changes. I love to participate in that way. So get me to get me to play a concert and we raise a bunch of money for the great cause. That's better than me sitting on my high horse telling everybody how they should think. Understood, understood. Um, and maybe we'll deploy that one day as we're looking to raise bunches of money to be able to help our students out here. Hey, at the I'm, happy but, to, I'm happy um, to come down. I live in LA, I drive down. You know, if I can come down there, play, play a few notes and help raise money for the right reasons, how great is that for me? Yeah, no, I appreciate that. I, I, I love you for that, my friend. So as an academic institution, the California State University of Dominguez Hills seeks to educate and mentor students who are pursuing careers in music and performance. So what advice would you give to those students who are considering a career in music? What do you want them to know? <laughs> I had to grab my sacks for that. It's like my security blanket. I saw it sitting over there and I just have to hold it. <laughs> well, here's the thing. And, and I think this is true, not just in music. And I have two sons, by the way, Year old and 27 and I tell them the same thing I've told them all their lives what you just become really great at what you love if, if you can find what you love become really great at it or whatever you're doing become really great at it so if you want a career in music the world would have a tr have trouble turning their back on somebody that's phenomenal they just would I mean if you're if you're mediocre you might need some luck you might need some networking to know this person that person to get some gigs but if you're phenomenal you're going to get gigs you're going to be sought after so it's it's simple thing is you know practice just practice those licks you know do that over and over and over all day long day after day year after year so that when you're talking to the president of cal state university and you're a little nervous you can still play those things perfectly because you practice them all the time so that's what it takes to get to get successful in anything it's consistent practice at whatever it is that you want to be good at and trust me it takes a long time but you you will get good at it. You just have to put the time in so practice doesn't make you perfect students it makes it you makes better you but also if you produce that excellence excellence will bring you opportunity that's what wow. i'm paraphrasing and you see and that's you why he's the president and i play the sax because those words were exactly what i meant to say but i didn't even have any of those words <laughs> no i'm just your friend so let me shift now to our faculty our faculty design and teach curriculum which helps our students uh, navigate their way through their majors and meet and master certain prerequisite knowledge and skills. Yet in our desire to be sensitive and in touch with what a workplace needs, our faculty have to be nimble enough to listen to industry feedback and incorporate such into the academic and co-curricular offerings that we provide to our students. So what trends do you see in the music industry? And what advice would you provide to our faculty 
in terms of the skills and competencies students must have to be successful in the music business, whether it's on the performance side, the business side, the you know writing side, whatever. What advice well, would you give? Well, we went. That? We already went through the performance side. The performance side is practice. Just right. getting those. I when I went to the University of Washington, yes, I graduated with an accounting degree, but honestly, uh, it was easy for me. I, I, numbers have always been easy. I didn't really even have to study for that. But I spent like five, six, seven hours a day in these little practice rooms practicing because I wanted to get better. So that's the performance side. You just got to practice and you got to become just really as good as you can possibly possibly be on the instrument. As far as the other parts of the in industry, today there's a lot of technology. Like in my studio, you see there's this big, huge console back there that's got a million knobs. Now, we need experts on that. We need them. So yeah. learn how that, how that works. There's great programs for writing music, for uh, film scores, all that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of technology when it comes to music now that you know, now it's better, better to be really well versed with all that stuff. In my old days, you didn't really have to know that. You just kind of had to be a good musician. Now you've got to know how to do the Pro Tools program, Logic program, all these ways of mixing, uploading, downloading, all that kind of stuff. So I would say just embrace the technology that's there and just become, become an expert at that. Put in your practice time for that kind of stuff. Yeah, beautiful. And by the way, Dominguez Hills is one of those places that has uh, academic curriculum that does th that very thing. So when we think about uh, audio yeah. engineers and, and digital uh, video, all that thing we do and we have some experts in. So uh, I think that's yeah. great advice. So I know you're a pretty phenomenal golfer. Now, I've, I've not just seen you in Celebrity <laughs> Charity Classics on TV. I've been out riding that cart w with you. And I want you to know, ladies and gentlemen, Everything you have seen and heard about his golf game is real. <laughs> and even Kit, uh, uh, one of the questions we got from one of our audience, uh, Ken Bentley, my good friend, asked, what makes you so passionate about golf? What is it about golf that drives you to be that passionate? But once you answer that, what I want to know is golf is one of those activities that allows you to achieve some kind of mm. balance in your life, which is necessary. What else do you do for balance? So first about your golf, what makes you so passionate? And where do you get the balance? Well, I think mind? golf to me is 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 very similar to uh, the musical instrument in the sense that it's it's you and it's up to you how good you want to get. I mean, if you want to put in practice time, you're going to get better. And I've always loved that. I've embraced it. So it's like, okay, I can go to the golf range and I can work on my golf game and get better. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to put that time in and it intrigues me because I already know that practicing something over a long period of time will show some great results. So that's why I'm passionate about golf is because I really, not that I think I can beat Tiger Woods. I can't, I've, I've, I've played with Tiger Woods many times. I can't beat him. Let's just put it out there right now. There's no way, but I want to get to the point where I'm really proud of my golf shots. I'm, I'm somewhat proud of them now, but not enough. So I keep trying to get better and better and better. So it's, it's that passion, the individual studying hard, working at something that, that you're interested in and watching yourself uh, reap the rewards of all that hard work. That to me is, turns me on, it gets me excited. So that's why I love golf. As far as another, uh, other things I do, I'm a pilot. So I, I, love, I love that. And, and in, in a sense, it's the same thing. It's, it's an individual, you study flying, you, you learn some skills and now the reward is, hey, I can walk into an airplane and fly it. And it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's cool. And nice yeah. to have the balance. And are there are there special places you have to go to mentally to get the balance or the separation away from your craft that you're obviously very passionate about? Or does it come natural for you? So you just want you to disengage. Usually once to once I close the sax case, it's almost like uh, it's like a, a trigger that when I latch my sax case up, it's like I my mind just definitely I don't even think about music. I'm gone. I'm off. I'm off to other things. You know, whether it's exercising or I like watching movies. Um, movies a lot are, are a lot of an escape for me. I love watching a good movie. So I think that's it. I don't really think I have to. Um, I don't need to, to go into a room with a spa and find that peace of mind. I can just kind of get it as, as soon as the sax is back in the case. So the, and with the same light, um, if I know I've got a gig that night, it's like let's just say I had a gig tonight somewhere then there would be no relaxing today. Today, would, the whole day would be about preparing. 
I need to make sure I'm physically in the right, in the perfect uh, condition for the show, which means I can't be too, too, too full. I can't be too hungry, but it's better to be too hungry than too full. So I've got to manage how I eat, exercise, make sure my body's feeling limber, make sure everything's ready. And I got to have the right energy. I'm making sure my sax is warmed up. I put my practice time in. So I, all of it is geared toward that. So on gig days, it's going to be tough to find me relaxed in any way until about midnight. When the gig is over, I put the sacks away and I'm walking back to the tour bus. Then I'm probably in the most relaxed state I can be that day. So ladies and gentlemen, if you want to know why Kenny is looking a little <laughs> geared up now, it's because he's getting ready to perform for you in a short while once we finish our, our questions. So let me get back to our interview. So in life, you know, along the way to dreams and aspirations, life happens. It's like there are momentary setbacks, mistakes, or even failures that are often painful in the moment, but also serve as important teachable moments in our lives. And I wonder if you can share with us a circumstance in your life that didn't quite go as well, you know, as you wanted it to go, but what did you learn from that that now helps you out later on in your career well, and in your personal life? Well, we all have our disappointments. Believe me, it doesn't always go. Yeah. Even if you're as prepared as you hear the way I talk, prepare, 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 and then you get on stage and somehow you don't have it. But I think the first time it happened was probably the most important for me was in high school. Um, I went uh, like, so coming from junior high, so yeah, I'm aging myself. We had junior high, which was seventh, eighth and ninth grade. And high school started in 10th grade. Okay, so seven, eight, nine, uh, I'm playing sax in my little junior high school band and I'm first chair, you know, and I'm used to being first chair, which means I feel like I'm, you know, better than whoever else is playing sax. So as I go to high school, I'm excited to be part of the high school jazz band. Well, I get to high school in 10th grade, as did other junior high school students from other junior highs that I had no idea who, they, who these people were. It's not like we were connected with, with uh, computers back then. It's like, you didn't know anybody. So I get their audition and I don't make the band. I'm not as good as all the other sax players that were auditioning for the band. I'm not as good. So I went home basically and thought, I guess I just need to practice. And I started to practice. And now again, I don't know how good I'm getting compared to anybody else, but I came back in my 11th grade and was so far better than everybody else in, that had already been playing in the band that I immediately became first chair. And it just was a, a light bulb that said, wow, honestly, if you practice, you're just going to get better. And wow, I'm not going to stop because I, I want to get so much better. And that was kind of the trigger. And as you see, we've in our conversation today, practicing and getting better is, seems to be the theme for me. So that started then. And it was all because I failed to make the band the first time. Uh, an important lesson, I think, for our students and even the adults who are part of our program tonight, that you know, sit back paying the dues. I mean, uh, my good friend Cornel West reminds us that in life, there will always be instances of unjustified suffering, unmerited pain and undeserved harm. The question is never do things happen to you, but rather how do you figure out a way to sustain some movement or momentum in the face of whatever adversity you're confronting, right? And so glad that you're able to get back up on the horse and just persist through that. Now, I know our time is getting short and we've got to get to a concert and, and I see you getting ready to play. You got your suit on, the tree lit, the board is behind you, you got your instrument in your hand. <laughs> I would play this one except I have no musical <laughs> talent at all. But I see over here that, that Teddy Toro, our mascot, is kind of saying, look, Dr. P, we got to have a little fun with Kenny too. So let me go to some fun questions. So if you were a superhero, what would be your theme song? Because every superhero has to have a theme song. What would be your theme song if you were a superhero? Um. <laughs> there, Indiana Jones, right there. I'm Indiana Jones. Indiana Jones, and here's what I almost had it right, but I never played it before. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. Wow. Um, 
love yeah, love the movies by the me way too. love love that um what you want no teddy uh, teddy says of all of the singers and vocal stylists that you have worked with who would you now want to do an instrumental vocal duo with you mean that i haven't why? already done haven't i haven't already worked with or pick somebody well, you've already I mean, done it with before. I, I, I would say probably might, the most fun i had doing a duet was with Smokey robinson just because he's such yeah. a nice guy such a nice guy you know a lot of times you do these solos you're in your studio alone you send it in but he was standing right next to me just like doing that big smile that Smokey robinson has so that was a lot of fun so if i had another chance i would do that but honestly um let's see i just did a duet with the weekend uh the last couple months and that was really fun what a great artist really uh He's dedicated, like like I'm dedicated, he's dedicated. So we really connected that way. But I would just have to say that if I could get Paul McCartney to call me and ask me to play on one of his songs, I think that would be pretty amazing. Elton John, Paul McCartney, Beyonce, somebody, any of those three, I'm there. <laughs> Paul McCartney, Elton yeah. John, or Beyonce. All right, so if you're out there listening or folk in the audience, yeah. we're all over the country here. Yeah. If you know any of those folk, can you? No problem. And, and now that we're that. virtual, you know, honestly, yeah, all they have to do is send me a file. I'll load it into the computer right there. I'll put the solo in, give it back to them, and it'll be, uh, you know, nobody gets hurt. It'll be easy. <laughs> <laughs> we know that to be the case as well. So as we think about winding down this part of the program, I want to see if you have any last minute words of encouragement or advice for our students and on our campus kenny we've got 17,700 mm. students at this campus six colleges so arts and humanities that you saw dean avila uh college of business administration public policy college of education natural and behavioral sciences college of health human services and nursing and a college of international mm. and extended education and one of the best libraries, I think, around uh, that Dean Raisley runs. So when you think about that and those 17,000 students, we have high underrepresented minority students here. We're about 85% mm. students of color. We've got a high number of kids mm. who are first generation, whose mm. parents have never been to university. A high number of them who are Pell eligible, who flow into the Pell Grant. So even within that realm, 60% of them have an EFC. That's the expected wow. family contribution of zero. And so that means they're so economically challenged, we don't expect them to contribute a dollar to their education. And we have some kids through no fault of their own, our students come to the campus who are less prepared to manage the rigors of a university environment. So we have what I call the big four. But Cal State University, Dominguez Hills and the California State University system generally prides itself on trying to provide excellence in academics and research and access to as many uh, uh, members of the citizenry as we can, because we think there's so much talent that exists among a population, we wanna be able to do that. So what advice would you give to those students who are struggling and working two jobs and trying to navigate their way through this, that as we get ready to the holidays, they just finished their first uh, semester of 2020 and about to go into the holidays here in the end of finals week. What advice well, would first you of all, I think they're pretty lucky to have you as the president of the school. You're a great example right there. Look at that. I'm lucky doctor, doctor. I mean, you know, it just shows that you put the time in and you can rise to all sorts of levels and you've risen to a great level. So you're a prime example. Great. Just if I was a student, I'd want to I'd want to shadow you and just pick your brain all the time on how you did it. So there's one one thing that they can do is just spend some time with you. That's what's my first advice. So, um, but honestly, when I've traveled, I've traveled the world. I've been, you know, I, I, I spent a lot of time in Asia, been to Europe so many times, been to Africa a dozen times, South America. And, and I get to see people all over the place, India. And there, I see a common thing that I see in most, in, in, in most people. And that is most people are short-term thinkers. They're short-term thinkers. And it's like, this year I want to get a new computer and now I want to get this and I want to have this. And nobody's thinking long-term like, you know, 
like you would mention, some people are working two jobs. Okay, so sa save that. Save as much as you can. Don't spend a lot. Don't go to Starbucks if you don't can't afford that coffee. Go to someplace else that's, if you need your coffee, figure out another way, you know, and little by little and, and stay patient and watch everything grow. Not only have, have I talked about, you know, you practice your talent grows, but as far as business is concerned, little by little, a business can grow. And over time, that's how people become very successful is they let things grow instead of spending all the time just for the, the things that they want for that particular time period. So I would just say my big, my big, uh, uh, I'm on a soapbox. I would just say, take your time, be patient and just keep going and don't lose faith that it's going to work out. It will work out. It's just that you might be the guy that doesn't have the computer. I use that as an example. You might not have the computer when you're 21, but boy, when you're 30, you'll be able to buy 10,000 more computers than the guys that did have the computer at 21 because they've spent all their money all the way from 21 to 30 and you've been saving and, and now it's been growing because you've invested it well. So it's basically, I use money as an example, but it's just investing, letting it grow, and reaping the benefits. I think that's the key. Yeah, thanks for that. Kenny, your words are inspiring. Your music is stimulating. And the joy you have brought to people's lives throughout your musical artistry is really immeasurable. Uh, on behalf of my wife, Davida Hopkins Parham, my first lady, uh, my two daughters, Kenya and Tanya, who are uh, watching as well, and they say hello. They're like, don't you come <laughs> home, Dad? And I say hello girls. to Kenny G. So <laughs> Tanya and Kenya say hello as well. Um, and really the entire California State University, Dominguez Hills, Toro Nation family. All of our alumni, over 100,000 around wow. the world that we've graduated. We want to express our sincere thanks and appreciation to you for agreeing to be our guest for this Presidential Distinguished Lecture. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please get ready to be entertained by the instrumental stylings of Kenny G. So after this short recess to get ready, and you see Kenny getting all geared up for this now, after this short recess, please enjoy some more of the musical artistry from some members of our own California State University Domingo Hills faculty. And once we come back from the break, we'll be ready for the concert. Dean Avalo and Scott, let me kick it Thank back. Thank you very to you. much, Thomas. Kenny, thanks. It was again. a pleasure. It, it was a pleasure indeed. Thank you both so much. That was really fabulous and very much inspiring. So, Cal State Dominguez Hills, I know you are going to enjoy Kenny's performance in just a few minutes. We're going to give you a chance to take a small break, maybe a five minute intermission, except you're not going to want to go away um, because we're going to instead have a short musical interlude. By our own, two of our own great uh, Toro family faculty members, Scott Morris and Chika Nui. And you're gonna love this. This is really a fabulous uh, example of the great work that our faculty do. So without further ado, here's Scott and Chika, followed by Kenny.
Hello. Um, thank you, Dr. Parham. Thank you, Kenny, for the uh, inspirational uh, uh, words. I hope our students learned a lot uh, from it. Um, and, uh, you know, not just our saxophone students, although we, we do have uh, some really good saxophone students, thanks to our world-class saxophone faculty, uh, Tio Tros Avery and, and Chika Inoue, who you just saw there in the video from Mallorca, which I just got back from, um, barely made it in time. Uh, and, uh, you know, really hoping they, they listen to you, Kenny, and uh, put in those three hours a day and uh, never stop. Um, again, I'm, I'm Scott Morris, Chair of the Department of Music here at California State University. And it's a really exciting time um, to be part of the music program here. Uh, we've had a number of really amazing things happen over the last five years. Um, we've pretty much doubled the number of students in our program, uh, not just doubled uh, the number of students, but also just the, the you know, level of student that we've been attracting, just so dedicated. Um, it's, uh, it's really difficult to get a practice room uh, on a normal day. Well, not now, um, we're, we're, we're closed um, the campus uh, physically anyway. Um, we've been approved for a bachelor of music degree, uh, which is a professional degree in, in performance. We had liberal arts and music education before, but uh, uh, starting soon, we will we'll be able to offer that professional performance degree, which has been approved by the campus uh, curriculum uh, uh, process and uh, is now over at the Chancellor's office. Um, we're a NASM accredited uh, campus, that's NASM, National Association of Schools of Music, and we just finished our 10-year reaccreditation, and uh, that went very, very well. Uh, we have a beautiful uh, new recital hall, uh, laser recital hall in uh, La Corte Hall, so uh, when we're back on campus, I invite you all to come and join us. I believe it's uh, the nicest small recital hall um, in the CSU system, and there are 23 campuses, so that's, that's saying a lot, but I think it's one of the best small recital halls in, in all of Southern California. Um, our, fa our faculty is fantastic. We've got, you know, a number of Grammy winners, members of groups like the Los Angeles Guitar Quartet, Count Basie Orchestra, Los Angeles Philharmonic, the Lana uh Band, and many, many more. Um, so we're, we're very proud of the faculty that we have, the students that we have, the direction that we're headed in, as a department. Um, I could go on and on and on um, about uh, all the things I'm proud um, of here at uh, California State University, Dominguez Hills, but that's not what you're here for. Um, you came to hear Kenny G play. Uh, so I'm gonna shut up and uh, let's all just sit back and listen to the music of Kenny G. Thank you. Hey, I am so excited to play for you guys tonight. Thank you for having me. This is really, really fun. I'm here in my studio and yet you can all hear me at the same time. This is pretty awesome. Okay. I've put together a group of songs I think you're gonna enjoy, and the first one is a song that we normally play live when we have a full orchestra. Although we don't have the orchestra tonight, I'll be live, and I think it's gonna sound really great from the studio. It's called Loving You.
Well, are we liking it so far? My iPhone's going up and down. I'll take that as a yes. All right. All right, now I'm going to make the executive decision to change directions right now because it's that time of year, okay? As you see, my studio is all decked out for the holidays. Nice tree. I've got a wreath. And I'm in the spirit of the holidays right now. So let's get started with some holiday music.
Everyone, thanks again for tonight. Let me say goodbye with a beautiful melody, one that I didn't write, but it's just so beautiful. I really want to play it for you. And I also want to say, stay safe until we meet again.
Thank you, Kenny, and thank you, Torles, for joining us tonight. It was a really wonderful program, and I hope everybody enjoyed today's presidential lecture. On a personal note, I just want to say it's been a wonderful five and a half years here at Cal State Dominguez Hills, and uh, good things to campus, and I wish each of you every success in your coming years here at, at Dominguez Hills. Have a wonderful evening, everyone, and remember, once a Toro, always a Toro. Goodbye.